Well, hey, good morning, Central family. Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. If this is your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us. Let's stand to our feet this morning as we go to the Lord in worship, as we sing of His faithfulness and His power. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Your word is a lamp unto my But I want to be on it. Oh, it's a narrow road. Your mercy is wide. You're good on your promise. Come on, let's declare this. I'll take you at your word. The chaos fell in. Hey. But I know, because I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, and the tide is high. Our God, amen. 
Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose And those walls are up Remember those giants we called death and grave were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came, and he died, and he rose, and those giants are dead. Come on, you believe that this morning? Hey! Oh, this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us, and this is our God, this is what he does, he saves us, he bore the cross, let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus oh. Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word Altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail And he never will Oh, this is our God This is who he is He loves us This, this is our God And this is what he does Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Him This is our God This is who He is What he does, he saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave. So let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross and beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Our job. 
as I was thinking this morning and as we were worshiping, I found myself thinking about the faithfulness of God. And then I found myself reflecting on the verse in Psalm where it talks about, I look to the hills, where does my help come from? That my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And in a space like this, it's so easy to come in and bring with us the busyness of our week. It's really easy to come in and to bring in the stress of the week with us. But a friend of mine once reminded me that as I praise and as I worship, as I set my gaze higher, as I look on where the Lord is, that everything in my life gets a lot less messy. It all becomes a lot smaller, it becomes a lot easier. So can we take these next moments in worship? Can we leave everything outside these four walls out there for just a little bit longer and focus on who Jesus is as our savior, as our creator, as the one who just wants to dwell in us and with us this morning? There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sin for every curse is blood One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn Was sacrificed
Open the floodgates of heaven. We're calling on the God of Jacob. We're calling on the God of David. We're calling on the God of Abraham. The same God that we read about in the word. The same God that we hear about throughout history. A God of power. A God of miracles. We're calling on that same God this morning. Father, I don't know what many of us are walking in with this morning, but I know that we serve a God who is faithful. I know that we serve a God who is good. We, we know that we serve a God who is powerful and he's a healer. He's a God who restores. He's a God who is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. We declare that this morning, that as we are in this room, you are walking with us. That your Holy Spirit is flowing and moving in the hearts of every person in this room, God. We declare transformation. We declare healing. We declare broken chains in the name of Jesus. As we sing, all hail King Jesus. We are declaring your power over our lives, God. Savior of the world. We're singing, we'll take you at your word because we know that you are faithful, God. We're declaring this is our God. Faithful, mighty, powerful. Be glorified, be magnified in our hearts and in our lives this morning. I pray that every song we sing, Lord, may be a declaration of faith in you and your power of who you are, God. That we may realize what we're singing. The power of the words that we're singing, Lord. Be glorified, be magnified in this place, Lord. We give you our hearts. We come before you completely open and humble to your will, to your power. I pray over an anointing over Patty this morning as she shares the message. Lord, I just pray that it be you speaking through her. You may lay the words that she needs to say that we need to hear this morning, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. I pray all these things, Lord, in your mighty and your beautiful name. Amen and amen. Hey, as always, it is Minute Mingle time. This is a great opportunity for you to go greet somebody that you don't know, greet somebody that you haven't seen in a while. You get a whole minute, so go.
Yes, good morning. Can I ask all of you who are veterans who've uh, served our country to stand, please, just so that we could honor you? Yes, we've got, can we just show our appreciation? Thank you, you can take your seats. We wanted to do that in advance because it's interesting when, um, when Veterans Day occurs just before a Sunday, it's when do we do it? And uh, we wanted to make sure that those of you who have served uh, so, so faithfully for our freedom knew that we were thinking of you in advance of that day uh, rather than uh, afterwards. So again, thank you all so much for your service. Yeah, and good morning and welcome everyone to Central. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. My name is Vipka. This is my husband, Craig. We want to welcome you as well if you're joining us online. Thank you for, for being part of this service. And I just want to say, uh, maybe this is your first time here at Central, or maybe you've just been coming for a little while, but you've never really met anyone. We have Central Connect out in the lobby, and um, I'd love for you to just stop by there and, and say hello to Amy and Nate are there this morning, and they'd like to meet you. They have a free gift for you as well. Just our thank you for hanging out with us this morning. And I said in the first service, when we travel, when we go on vacation, and we go to a church service, and they offer something like this, we always go. She always goes, I <laughs> carry want, on the coattails. <laughs> well, we want a free gift, first of all. Who doesn't? <laughs> but then I think sometimes when I look back at the times when we've attended our churches or visited churches like that, um, I remember those conversations that we had. So we just want to encourage you, come and meet Amy and Nate and, and talk to them or ask any questions that you might have. Yeah, and that leads on to um, just pathways into connecting, as Vipka has said. It's often the conversations we have at church that... Uh, linger more than often what we hear even from the stage because relationships are that important so we've got two tools to help you take that step to get to know people the first is uh, the central happenings and uh, that basically is something that you can download through a QR code you can open up your uh, phone point it at that with the camera app and then basically it'll take you to the link. Vic and I say this all the time, there's so much going on at Central, so much going on in our lives so we can't keep it all in our head. And so what we do is we refer to Central happening. So hopefully that will be something that would be helpful to you too. Uh, and when you go through that, there may be questions you may have, there may be other steps you want to take. And so you can text Central Holland to 94000, that's 94000 at Central Holland, and then you have eight options. You heard last week that a number of you used option eight when I mentioned it, so why don't we go for option nine this week and um, see what Marcus does with that. The point with that is there are a number of options on there, but uh, there are a team, there, there is a team of people who would love to connect with you with any questions you have about getting connected even more at Central. Those are two tools that we have to help you connect. Talking about so much going on, do you know that Thanksgiving is right around the corner? And we're so excited that we have a service here on Thanksgiving at 10 a.m. It's a combined service here in the worship center. And we'd love for everyone to come. It's a family service. And we're also going to share communion, celebrate communion um, on that day because each one of us have so much to be thankful for. And yet there's nothing we're more grateful for than what Jesus did for us as he died for us. Yeah, that's right. And uh, at our Thanksgiving service every year, we do a Thanksgiving offering. It's been a tradition that we've had for many, many, many years. And uh, this year, the Thanksgiving offering that we will be doing is going to be targeted to um, global missions, our family of churches. And as we were thinking about this, we were thinking about people like Pastor Peter, for example, who planted 13 churches in war-torn Ukraine. And if you've been following anything that's been going on um, in the world this week, and even in our own nation, you'll know that the debate at a political level is coming about where funding goes. Does it go to Israel? And we know that that's important. But there's a political debate about whether funding continues to go to the Ukraine. Now, whether funding goes there or not, what we know is that we have a family of churches over there. We have a family who will be serving there in a war-torn country, and they're doing an absolutely amazing work. But there's always needs. And so a portion of what we will take there will go to people like Pastor Peter, but there are so many more. There's also Pastor Sandy, Pana, David in Nigeria. And um, we often talk about how much harder it is with a minister and how dangerous it often is with a minister. So we're grateful that we get to support them. And we have set a goal of, of raising $50,000 over and above regular mission offerings. And a, a 
a big chunk of that often comes in through the Thanksgiving offering. So we are right now praying about what God would lead us to give. And just want to invite you as well to pray with us what God would lead you to, to give to these ministries that we've just heard about. Yeah, and talking about uh, giving, over the last few weeks, we've been taking a moment to reflect on the significance of giving. Last week, Marcus and Anna just talked about how God uh, cared first, He loved first, He gave first. And so one of the key things that we are called to do is just emulate, follow in His example. We love, we care, we give, and we do that first. The significance of the first is often uh, underestimated. If you were to look at Genesis and Exodus, for example, the word firstborn occurs at least 38 times in those books. The word first occurs 40 times in those books. There is a profound symbolic and spiritual meaning to the idea of loving first, caring first, giving first. And when we dig into that meaning, what we understand is that the first is actually connected to this idea of consecration. That when we step up and do the first, give the first, what we're doing is consecrating what we are giving to the Lord for His purposes. Now, consecration and mindful is not a word that we use that often. So some of you may be thinking, okay, Craig, I don't even know what this word consecrate means. Maybe some of you use it every day. <laughs> but to consecrate, consecrate something is basically to spiritually purify it by dedicating it back to God. And while we just heard the first is important, it's, it's important because it's a first, but also because it is really personal. And if you remember back in Genesis 17, I think it's verses 10 through 14, God establishes that covenant with Abraham and a sign or symbol of that covenant was circumcision. And I wondered sometimes if Abraham thought, that's a little bit private for you to ask me to dedicate, to give that part to you. But God's really intentional about asking um, that the symbol or uh, the sign of that covenant be between him and, and, and the people of God would be something that only he could see because it wasn't visible from the outside. So yes, Abraham was the first to do it because it was actually personal. Yeah, Abraham's the first to tithe. You see there, the first with circumcision, it was something that was important, but it was something that was profoundly personal. And so there is a sense in which when, when we talk about giving, what we're talking about there is an act that is important because we follow God's example, but it's also an act that is profoundly personal. It's between us and God. And so when we give, what we are essentially doing in following this scriptural foundation is we are consecrating our finances to God, trusting Him, uh, with all that he has given us and uh, we have been given so much so when we say at central uh, put that emphasis on giving that's essentially the foundation that we're building it on it's something that's important because we follow god's example but it's something that's personal it's something that we do bet between us and god before us and god because only god sees it now, as always at Central, there are three ways to give. You can give online. That's the way Vip and I do that. We give regularly um, through online. There is also, you can give this in one of our giving kiosks in the balcony, also in the lobby. And uh, you can also give by mailing in a check. And as you do that, just recognize that uh, your giving is ultimately between you and God, but it is also something that we take very seriously. And we're really thankful for what God is doing through it. Now, we're starting a new series today called We Love Holland, and um, it, when we do things like this, Vipka and I together, we usually can divide things up pretty well, but this next part, we were both debating because both we it. both wanted to do it, exactly. <laughs> so, of course, when we debate something, who do you think wins? Vipka, go on. <laughs> so, we both get to say a word about our speaker today, who's Patty. Um, Patty's on staff here at Central. She is definitely one of my favorite people here on staff. And if I was to sum her up, I would just say she's a person who loves God and who loves people with passion. And she's also an amazing leader. So you're in here for a treat. My, one of my kids has a saying, um, I'm crying on the inside. And I felt like in the first service, I was sitting here crying on the inside. It was so, so good. So you're in for a treat. Yeah, when we uh, put this series together, um, we were putting, we had a plan A, which was planned before I had my brain moment, and then we had a plan B. And as we were putting plan B up here, we were thinking about uh, people uh, to speak, and uh, 
Patty was someone who jumped, not just to my mind, but to our staff's mind. You'll soon understand why Patty is leading a message like this. There are a number of qualifications we look at for someone to stand on the stage. One of them is obviously that they need to love, uh, love God. They need to have made uh, Jesus the personal Lord and Savior of their life. They need to love scripture, command it well, but also that they need to live the message that they preach. So as you just hear this message, we can attest, and you hear this through what Patty shares, that this is a person who lives the word that she preaches. So Patty, it's an honor uh, to sit and uh, to listen to you. Would you all uh, just join me in welcoming Patty to the stage? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. It's such an honor to be here this morning, and it's truly an honor to be on this team. Um, it's one of those things where you wake up every morning, and you're like, man, I get to do this. Uh, and that's an everyday thing uh, for me. And like Vipka and Craig said, I get to serve on staff here as the missions director. And sometimes you hear a title and you're like, what in the world does that even mean? Um, and I help, get to help facilitate missions here at Central. So that looks like local outreach, missionaries. Yes, we still support missionaries. Um, and some other fun things that we get to do around here. I'd be glad to talk to you about it anytime. Outside of that, I am a wife and a mom. My husband Aaron and I have been married for 15 years and we've got three kiddos, a 12-year-old, a nine-year-old, and an eight-year-old. So we are in full-on like parental taxi cab carpool season of life um, and we love it. It's really great and we love being part of Central. Um, our family loves to serve in preschool. My husband gets to mow on the mow team with facilities and that's always a lot of fun. It's the introvert's favorite way to serve. You can just listen to your music, your podcast and um, be really helpful, which is really great. <clears throat> Aaron and I both grew up in Holland. He was a North Sider. I was a South Sider. And I can say now we both we live downtown, so we're South Side one for us. Um, and we, we love being part of our city. We love being within walking distance of things. Um, and we really love being part of our community. Um, on our street, I did some counting as I got ready for this. Um, we have 21 kids that live on our street. Not our block, just our street and 11 dogs. So it's a little crazy, a little busy, and of those 21 kids, the bulk of them are boys. So there's a lot of baseballs and basketballs and soccer balls flying at any given point. Um, and sometimes there's some little scuffles, but we manage. And if you ever drive down our street, aside from seeing all these kids all over the place and bicycles and things, you'll see grown-ups, moms, dads, grandparents, gathered at the bases of driveways or on front porches, just doing life together. You know, right now in our neighborhood, you can look down the street and you can see a wide variety of signs and expressions of beliefs, and they're not all the same. You wouldn't drive down our street and go, man, they're all on the same team, they're on the same side. All... No, it's not that, that's not the case at all. You know, in our neighborhood, actually, last weekend, we had a pumpkin carving party. So you can, you know, when you live downtown, streets are a little busy, so you can request for the road to be closed only a couple times a year. And last Sunday was one of those Sundays, and so you know, you're pulling card tables out into the road, and kids are putting their pumpkins up, and they're getting ready to carve them. And there's another table, so the neighborhood, all everyone brings a dish to pass. And besides the fact that it was pouring rain, it was really wonderful. We had a great time. Um, there were some volunteers there, actually, who were helping teach our neighborhood about CPR, so we can be a heart-safe neighborhood. And so I'm talking to these volunteers, and one of the gentlemen looks at me and goes, man, look at this street. You know, so the kids are playing whatever game they were playing at that point, running around, giggling, having such a great time. Grown-ups are all in the middle of the road. And he's like, this is what my childhood was like. Um, and it was such, it's just a reminder of the privilege that we have to live where we are. And so we, we really do love where we live and love our city. Um, and you know, and though there's two camps for this, so don't judge me for this one, but we love tulip time. We love it. And we live right downtown, so it's great. We don't mind when it infiltrates everything. But in, in the middle of all of the pumpkin carving parties and tulip time and kids running and playing, there's been a lot of heart in our neighborhood too. There's been loss and illness, brokenness, all of those things. And but in that, we have our little community. We can put our beliefs aside, our, our stances aside, and truly love one another. We're gonna talk about that a little bit today. Um, 
We're going to be back in 1 Peter, so if you have a paper Bible, it's all the way in the back, or you can kind of scroll there if you need to. But before we dive into that, I want to kind of set the tone a little. You know, you're in this room. Imagine this room is filled with whispers, some of, you know, encouragement, others doubt and challenge you. It's a little bit about how the early Christians felt when Peter was writing to them. They were trying to stay strong in their beliefs while people around them didn't understand them or even mocked them. Sounds a little familiar, right? In our world today, with so much noise and so many opinions readily available, it's kind of hard to know where our beliefs stand in all of those. So this message in 1 Peter is a little bit like a pep talk, reminding us who we are, what we're all about. So let's dive into this age-old encouragement and see how it can give hope to us and hope to our community here in Holland. So in 1 Peter, Simon Peter is writing, and he's talking to early Christians who had been persecuted by Greeks and Romans for quite some time. And I love this. In verse 1, Peter starts off by calling them elect exiles. Right off the bat, sealing in their identity. He wrote this letter as an encouragement to those people that in their suffering, there's hope found in the resurrection of Christ and the promise of his return. In verse 3, he uses words like imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, trying to help them, maybe us, remember who we are and that our trials and persecutions don't change the promises of God. And then in verse 7, he says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on with this same message all through the first chapter. But he ends it in verse 25 by saying, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, I need to remind, be reminded that in that every day, the messy, the, the back and forth, that the word of the Lord remains forever. So in this moment, we're feeling pretty good, right? We've had a little pep talk from Peter about our identity in Christ, that we're reminded that the promises of God stand no matter the trial. So we're feeling pretty good. And then in chapter two, he starts it off by saying, so put away all malice and deceit and envy, hypocrisy and slander. None of us struggle with those things, right? If we're in a situation where our beliefs are being challenged or we feel persecuted, culture or we don't reserve, resort to slander and malice, right? If only that were true. You know the feeling, or at least I do, when you're in a situation or a conversation where someone indirectly or maybe even directly is challenging what you believe to your core. I have this feeling that rises up through me, through my belly, all the way into my face. Feels kind of heavy. Do you know that feeling too? There was a time when I was volunteering at one of my kiddos' schools. Um, if you've ever had elementary age student, then you've had students, you've had experience with a book fair. And in this moment, we're trying to set up this book fair for these kids. And so it's me and two other women who I know pretty well. One woman is a firm believer in Jesus and the other is questioning. And when I started on staff here, I actually started as our Kids Hope Director. Shout out to all the Kids Hope Mentors and Prayer Partners in the room. It's such a special program. And so we're spending some time at Jefferson, and this friend looks at me and goes, so what do you do at Central? And so I'm explaining to her what I do, and um, that our, the fact that our, this world around us, these miles around us, this campus, that Jefferson, is a precious mission field to us. I'm going on and on about how it's so special to me. And as I look up and I look over, the other woman's kind of laughing under her breath. And in that moment, I felt that heat start to rise up into my face and feeling a little embarrassed, a little challenged. But then after a few moments, I felt sadness. And I, and I wasn't sad because she was challenging what I believed. I was sad because she had no idea that the hope that couple came along with what I was talking about. And I know the woman's story and the hard that she had walked through and was walking through. But maybe when we're in those moments, we have to remember that those who don't know, don't know. If they've never experienced the goodness of God, how can we expect them to try and understand something that we believers can't even begin to fully understand? We have to remember everyone has a story. In that moment, I knew I could lean back and rely on God's promises. I knew that they didn't change. I don't always get there immediately, but I get there eventually. 
So Peter continues talking about God choosing them, that they're precious to the Father. He talks about God's steadfastness. He talks about how we, they, will disobey God's word as we are destined to do. But Peter is continuing to talking, and so now that we know that we're at, we've had our little Peter pep talk, we know what Peter's saying, we can kind of envision ourselves listening to Peter, we've gotten to the scripture that we're going to kind of camp out in. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, again, right off the bat, sealing in their identity in Christ. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Conduct is mentioned 13 times, at least throughout the New Testament. And Pastor Craig and Pastor Corey have shared with us in the past, when something's repeated so frequently in scripture, that's something we should pay attention to. Conduct's mentioned in, in Philippians 1.27, Matthew 7.12, Luke 6.31, Romans 12.13, over and over and over again. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Not if they speak against you as evildoers, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. Like Peter said above, no matter the persecution or the trial, God's promises remain the same. That when over if doesn't change the promises of God. I also really like how the message version has this, this verse paraphrased. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live exemplary lives in your neighborhood so that your actions will refute their prejudices then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join you in the celebration when he arrives. This world is not your home. Don't make yourself cozy in it. In CR, at the end of the serenity prayer, it says, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Are we living in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and in our social media spaces in a, in a way that undermines non-believers' prejudice of Christians or God or the church? Is our conduct winning them over? Are we living in a way that gives us the opportunity to speak into the lives of the people around us so that they may be supremely happy with God in eternity? Are we inviting people in with our conduct so they can join us in the celebration when he returns? That's a celebration we want everybody at, right? Is our conduct winning them over and inviting them in? A few years ago when I was spending some more time in the school, I spent a lot of time in the schools, um, I was interacting with a friend of mine and I'm trying to offer some privacy here to my friends, so just work with me on that. Um, but this friend of mine is an atheist and they're no more afraid to share that they're an atheist than I'm afraid to share that I'm a Jesus follower. And it's really special because God has really orchestrated some really great conversations uh, between the two of us. And so anyway, in this season, my friend walked through a really difficult season. And they found themselves in a situation where they felt like they had no hope, there was no clear next step, they had no idea what to do. And we did something unique, and this is not something we can do all the time. Um, but I texted Pastor Molly at the time, and she texted, texted Pastor Mike, and in that moment, we knew in this unique situation there was something that we could do. And so I walked into my friend's office, and I was like, listen, we want to help. Central wants to help. And they looked at me, emotional, weeping, crying, and instantly said, why would you help me? You can't help me. I don't go to your church. I don't believe in God. You can't help me. Right? Her perception, her judgment in that very moment was that the church only helped their own. And in that moment, something beautiful happened. God moved in a big way, and I could say, it doesn't matter. We love you. We want to help. And ultimately, you know, they wept, they thanked me, and ultimately they didn't accept our help. And they're still atheists. And you might be thinking, okay, Patty, what kind of story is this? This isn't a very happy story. Um, but I know in this moment, God moved. In that moment, they thought that there was some sort of prerequisite for them to be loved and cared for by God. 
And God removed that. That was a kingdom win. And it doesn't matter that they didn't take the help. It doesn't matter that they didn't find Jesus yet. But now they know. It doesn't matter. God loves them. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. I think it's really important for you and I to remember that the seeds we plant, the ground that sowed, or the bricks we're taking down off of walls that we feel like are miles high and miles long, we may never see the fruit of that. But we can trust that we did our part and that the Holy Spirit can do the rest. There was no prerequisite for God's love for us. Are we setting up prerequisite, prerequisites or worldly prerequisites before we love and share God's love with those around us? In Romans 12:20, Paul says, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals onto his head. You'll surprise him. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals onto his head. I also really like how this one is paraphrased. If you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Your generosity will surprise them with goodness. Just before this in scripture, Paul's talking about vengeance quite extensively, and he's talking about how vengeance is not ours. Vengeance is God's. And then he says, to the contrary. Opposite. God's calling us to act differently than our flesh is calling us to. Not vengeance but kindness and love. Now, when Pastor Craig has shared with us before that when he first moved to Holland and he started pastoring here at Central, a group of people kind of took him around town, were showing him around, giving the lowdown on the city, things like that. And he asked them what their perception of Central was. And they said, a sleeping giant. Now, when I first came on staff, I maybe took that a little too personal uh, when I heard that. And I felt, to me, I felt so much shame. I felt ashamed. What light was I being, or we being, if the community that we were in saw us as sleeping giants? How do we take this tension that is a post-Christian culture where believers are becoming more and more the minority? We know Central is a generous church. We, we know that and you show it all the time. If that perception was or is still out there, are loving actions challenging that perception? Our partners know that they can call us when they need help. They, my house ministry knows they can call us and say, listen, our fridge is broken, can you help us? And man, we sure do try to say yes. Jefferson knows they can call us and say, man, our kids are hungry, we have no snacks left, can you buy us some snacks? We're gonna say yes. That day, by going to Sam's Club, we're gonna make sure those kids have snacks. We will say yes. But before we could be generous with our resources, we had to have conduct that was exemplary. We had to live in our neighborhoods in a way that honored our community. We had to show up over and over and over again with no prerequisite. Serving people is a privilege. Asking for help takes vulnerability, and it's our conduct that makes or breaks people's feelings of safety. We didn't walk into Jefferson and say, we'll buy you snacks only if. We didn't pick up that call from my house ministry and say, we will only buy you a fridge if those women come to church here on Sunday. We will help if, we will love if. That's not what we said. God doesn't call us to serve and love if we're getting something in return. He calls us to serve and love in persecution and with sacrifice. He talks about that a lot in Hebrews. To feed our enemies, to buy them lunch, to show them kindness and care. So what would it look like if Centra was known for its people, not only the resources that it has to offer? There's definitely a space and a need for that, don't get me wrong. But what would it look like if Central, you and me, were known for who we are? What if Community Action House could call when they had a shift at the food club that needed filled? And they knew Center would come. Not only would we come, but we would come in a way and show up in a way with conducts that puts all prejudice 
about Jesus to shame? What if positive options could call and say, we have a family who's facing unplanned pregnancy and they're faced with an insurmountable decision and our people would come. When HPS or Jefferson call, they know that we're going to walk into their schools and serve their staff and students regardless of beliefs and rules because we know we don't have to say God's name for him to enter in and change hearts. We know that we have to walk in with focus on our changed hearts because of the grace that we received from by Jesus being crucified and raised from the grave. To know when we're supporting families at Christmas time, because hello, Christmas is around the corner, with Christmas gifts and we invite them back for Christmas cookies, we're going to sit at those tables and in those spaces and we're going to listen as the Father does and love as Jesus does. It's not our job to change hearts. It's not our job to save people. It's our job to live exemplary lives among the Gentiles. It's our job to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit to move through us and change hearts so they can be there to join us in the celebration when he returns. It's tempting to believe that our great, the greatest images of our faith are, are displayed through massive crusades and life-changing acts, and though those things are important and have their place, I truly believe it's the everyday acts of kindness, the continual embodiment of Christ's love, that's what truly transforms the world and hearts around us. In a world that's increasingly skeptical about Christianity, it's not our debates and arguments that are going to win them over. It might indulge our egos a little bit, but it's not going to win anybody over. Instead, it's our genuine, loving, compassionate relationships that we build. It's the way we treat people in our day-to-day -day interactions. It's the way we live out our faith, especially when nobody is watching. Is the way you greet your neighbor that has a different sign in their yard from you with a smile? Stone removed. When that coworker challenges you, do you meet them with grace and kindness? Brick taken down. When you see your second cousin's post on social media, do you just avoid the comment section? Or when you see that opposing news sources Facebook post and you'd see that neighbor around the corner had to love it. Do you treat that neighbor any differently? Do you walk across the street anyway with a plate of Christmas cookies and a Christmas card and maybe an invite card? Seed planted. Because chances are, if you know that people believe something different than you, they know you believe something differently from them. Now, when you bring those cookies over, make sure they're good cookies. And, and, and maybe those people are going, man, those people are weird. They keep inviting me to church. They keep bringing me cookies. But man, they're nice. How about when you're in Meyer, and we always know the lines at Meyer are long. If there's someone that's got to catch that bus back to Rest Haven, do you let them step in front of you? Serving and loving with our time doesn't mean, have to mean, hours and hours of serving. Sometimes it does. But sometimes it's just moments in the checkout line. Now our team's going to come back up. And they're going to sing Christ be magnified as I close this, this out. What a great prayer for us to try and, and remember and embody and sing. Because Central, we're not called to be a sleeping giant. Let's not be known just for our generosity with resources, but also with time and compassion and honorable conduct. Let our actions echo the teachings of Christ so loudly that those who don't believe can feel and recognize his love through us. It's about showing up, being present, and loving unconditionally. It's about being Christ's hands and feet in a world that's yearning for genuine love and connection. I know we can all agree we are in a world that is yearning for genuine love and connection. When we do this, we not only bring glory to God, but we also cultivate a space where everyone feels valued, loved, and understood. Let's continue being a church that doesn't just talk about God's love, but actively lives it out. Now, if you would have told me a year ago, six months ago, 
four months ago, that I'd be standing here sharing with you, I would have really struggled to believe you. Frankly, I tried to avoid this space at all costs, if possible. But just as uncomfortable as this was for me, it might be just as uncomfortable for you to talk to that neighbor, to respond to that coworker with kindness and love. But what we can trust is that God doesn't only take the able, but the willing. And we can trust that when we walk this path with, cra- with grace and compassion and the unwavering love of Christ, the Holy Spirit can work through us. Let's give hope to Holland. One act of kindness, one relationship, one day at a time. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us today of our identity in Christ. Strengthen myself and Central in its mission and help us embody your love in Holland. Guide us to be authentic and impactful in our community. And as we go into this week, may we carry your light and love wherever we go. Amen. Will you stand with us? Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to live one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear Christ be magnified and were the whole
Thank you, Jeremy, Maddie, team. Thank you all so much. You know, I've heard, I don't know about you, but I've heard um, a number of messages through my lifetime on First Peter 2, th this challenge to live exemplary lives. And often it comes over, well, let me just say Craig-like, a little bit with a thump, where, where there's conviction, and it's the kind of wrong kind of motivation. Patty, what I appreciated about what you did was just the gentleness that was there for that. And, and just thank you for the way that you lived that out. And thank you for the way that you even shared a message encouraging us the right way to do this. So thank you, Patty, for um, just the time you took for that. And let this be an encouragement to us all to live lives that are exemplary. Live lives that really do encourage people to hear the gospel through what we say. There's that saying out there, if you can't share the gospel in words, then share it through your life. But at some point, the gospel always needs to take a verbal form. At some point, the gospel always needs to be shared. But we do live in a world where we have to live it before we can share it. So this week, be encouraged to go live out the gospel using your life. And may you be willing to take that first step, trusting that God, through His Holy Spirit, would lead you on from there. Thank you all so much for being here. We look forward to continuing this uh, series next week. And uh, we'll be delighted if you join us. Have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you soon.